I'm going to be flicking around a bit tonight, so some of the passages I've got written down here, um, some of them will be on the screen, but what we're doing is continuing on with our series on tough questions. And the tough question that I've been given tonight um, is, does God want me to be happy? We might at first glance think, hang on, that's not a tough question. There's a pretty easy answer to that. But to me, it's a tough question. And it's been something that God's been working in my life for probably 30 years, since I was very young. Um, And my understanding of this question has at times completely shipwrecked my faith. It's sent me off in directions where there's been no answers. But I keep coming around like a cycle, a circle. So I read something about it, I start to grip it, and I go, yeah, now I understand it. And then surprisingly, about a year later, I'm kind of like, hang on, I think I've forgotten this thing again. Where am I going? Where have I been? And it's like this thing that keeps starting again. So I wanted to go through this concept of does God want me to be happy with you tonight? Because for me, it's a very encouraging principle. Uh, My name's Nathan Webster, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm a a real life group leader here at the church. Um, I just want to start by saying I do believe in happiness. I do believe that God does want me to be happy. And I do want to acknowledge as well that there's times when we don't experience happiness. There's brokenness, we're in a sin-filled world, and life doesn't always go well for people. And it seems like some people just get the short straw in life, and nothing they can do can make it better. So this understanding of happiness and God's plan and God's will and suffering, they're all combined. Because the more we understand about happiness, the more we can leverage off that, and the more we can live a life that's honoring to God and in the direction that he wants, And we don't get shipwrecked when things don't go the way we hoped for. Let's open in prayer before we get into this. Father God, we just thank you that you are a good God. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that your word is true. We thank you that it's God-breathed as we heard about this morning. And we can rely on it. I just pray that you would speak tonight. You would speak to our hearts. You would be glorified through your message. And that people would walk away encouraged encouraged in you, we would have hope because you're a God who brings us hope. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is happiness? The first thing in working out if God wants us to be happy is to have a look at a bit of a description of what happiness is. And as you do, I looked at a dictionary first of all to say, well, what does a dictionary say about happiness? And one of the dictionary definitions I read, it said, it is a state of well-being, contentment, joy, A pleasurable or satisfying experience. There's a lot packed into those two sentences. There's a lot of stuff there in what we describe as happiness. And going a bit further, as you do in Google, I thought, I wonder what average people say about happiness. And I came upon this concept, which I wasn't that aware of, and I was a little bit concerned by it, this concept called positive psychology. So what does the world say about happiness? And there's a guy called Martin Silgman. And Martin Silgman is the author of a book called Authentic Happiness. Now, he's no small-time player in the world of psychology. He was the leader of the APA, the American um, Psychological um, Association. And at his inaugural inaugural speech, when he was given the title of president, he, he went into this meeting with a whole bunch of psychologists, probably all the best in the world, and he said, psychology is a half-baked field. It's half-baked, and I hear an amen from our counselling preacher. And it is half-baked. And what he meant by this, he went on to say, psychology, we've got it kind of worked out from a treatment point of view. We understand the symptoms. We understand the problems, and we medicate, and we treat. But we don't really understand, if you like, the cause. So he's saying, in our half-bakedness, we need to start baking the other side. We need to get into a prevention mindset. And the way he's talking about this prevention mindset is the concept that they call positive psychology. So you've got a definition there that he puts in his book, Authentic Happiness, and he says, it takes you through the countryside of pleasure and gratification up into the high country of strength and virtue and finally to the peaks of lasting fulfillment, meaning and purpose. Wow, get on that if you can, because that sounds awesome. But what does it mean? It's hard. Like, uh, to me, I read that, and I'm just like, that's some lofty thing that someone would say that's not really in our grasp. It's still not quite measurable, not quite obtainable, and it slips through our fingers. And the concept of measuring happiness is another thing after we define it. And bizarrely, people try to measure this thing called happiness. The United Nations actually has a thing, which is legit, look it up, called the World Happiness Report. 
right? And they do a survey amongst all countries, and they give each country an indicator out of 10. So one to 10, not, one not happy, 10, you're up there. Now about seven and a half is about the highest it gets, so three quarters happy is like the top of the nations. Not surprisingly, you won't find Australia, New Zealand, or America in the top 10. The reason I say not surprisingly, I'll get to a bit later, countries like Norway, um, sort of the, the, the Nordic kind of regions were up there, um, Probably also not that surprisingly, some of the really undeveloped nations, Africa, India, places like that, uh, some of the countries within Africa were also in the lower, lower regions. But it was a bizarre concept. I never thought to measure this thing. I didn't think you could measure it. It was just a, like a fantasy, but they do. And taking this concept of, of happiness one step further, there's a country called Bhutan, which is actually a Buddhist country, and they're on it. They, they love this thing. So what they've done is they've actually gone out of their way and said, you know what, gross domestic product, that's what we measure our achievement on, GDP, normally. We don't care about that. We've got a thing called GNH, which is gross national happiness. And they're, no, I'm legit, seriously. And their whole drive is about measuring happiness, and the ranking of their happiness is actually an indicator for success of their country. How much money are we making? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Are we happy? Yes? All right, we're winning. And there's actually some wisdom in that. There really is, and it's quite a, quite a funny thing, but I actually thought it was awesome. Um, thought you'd like it too. Um, the UN's also had a, a concept. Um, they had a meeting, which they're actually calling uh, meeting. It's an actual, actual whole uh, running thing they do every year, called Happiness and Wellbeing, Defining a New Economic Paradigm. Happiness and Wellbeing, Defining a New Economic Paradigm. They're actually getting this point where they're saying there's actually something there what Bhutan is doing. There's this concept that our wealth is actually measured in things more than money. Our wealth, our well-being is actually something that defines the value of our nation. And I thought that was a really good thing, a really good challenge, because we quite often want it, but it's not something our, our nation would... I don't see it happening in Parliament. I don't see us get, dropping GDP for all the economics that we love in this country and saying, G&H, that's where we're going, people. You'd probably find a change of government over that, I would think. But, um, yeah, anyway, it's one of those things. So we've understood a little bit about what defining happiness is. We've understood a little bit about how we measure it. And the next thing that's really crucial is how we obtain it. How do we get this thing called happiness? And the reality is that people go to ridiculous, extraordinary efforts to try and obtain happiness. They try to get joy. They try to have the meaning of life. And they adopt phrases that go through their, their whole vocabulary, their life. They call it like a, a plan. You hear things like, if it feels good, do it. YOLO, you only live once for all you young people out there. Things like that. And you think, well, you know what? You only live once. Why not? It makes me feel good. I'm going there. And we've got this concept that seems to magnify the problem, in my opinion. It bombards us with the feeling of a need. It's marketing and media. They go like this, they're together. This concept of giving us this need. We might not even have a need, but the, the science behind marketing is to show us something that they have, build this need or this hole in our life, and they say, this product, this service, this experience that we're selling will fill that thing that you are missing out on, and you'll be whole. You'll have a better life, you'll have happiness, and you'll love it. And we buy into it. I buy into it. I've got an eye, everything. I want new motorbikes. I want this. I want that. So, so that concept of marketing really does work. And the more I focus on advertising, stuff that comes with my Facebook, the more I want, I start to click on these things. I look it up. What's this about? And it really just consumes my time. It really consumes my, my mindset. But people find it everywhere. They find fulfillment, or they try and find fulfillment and happiness in things like good jobs, in money, in power, in success in health, in eternal youth, plastic surgery, good looks, in toys like cars and bikes and boats, like I've said, in drugs, in experience, you name it. People think this is going to give me this elusive thing of happiness, and I'll have made it. And if we're honest, and if we think about it ourselves, what is it that makes you happy? What is it that makes you happy? We could probably all give the right church answer if we're sitting here about what is it that makes us happy. But what actually is it that makes us happy? And that's what I want to concentrate on tonight. In the book of 2 Samuel, in chapter 11, we read a story about a search for happiness that just goes horribly wrong. And it's a story of King David. And he walks out, and he's on the roof. And he's not even meant to be there. He's meant to be at war. But he's on the roof, and he looks down, and he sees the wife of one of his 30 best soldiers having a bath on the roof 
of a building nearby. Instead of walking away, he has a look and he says, yeah, I like that. That's good. And so lust confuses him. It steps in. And as the king, he has the power to do basically what he wants. So he abuses that power. He gets his servants to bring that woman and he commits adultery. And not just adultery. He's ashamed by what he's done. So then he goes out of his way to murder her husband. And this series of events that happens ultimately unravels his whole kingdom. The consequences for this thing are huge. And we'd look at an example like that, or I would look at an example like that, and my first feeling is to say, well, I wouldn't do that. That's a bit extreme. But the sad thing is, any one of us are one or two decisions away from that type of sin. If we're honest, there is nothing that anyone has ever done that in the right circumstances, with the right pressures, and with the wrong mindset, that any of us wouldn't fall into. People make terrible mistakes. We see it all around us. We see pastors of churches fall in ways that we just... Their first thing is to almost judge them. Why would they do that? But the reality is, that's how sin works. It tricks us into thinking there's something better. David was actually a man described as a man after God's own heart. He wasn't just a no one. He knew what it was like to worship God, to honor God. He loved God, and he was tricked into believing a lie... A lie that this thing he thought would give him temporary happiness would actually be better than going without, than following God's word. In Luke 12, we read another example of this type of thing that actually resonates with me quite clearly. We read about a rich farmer. This rich farmer has made it. He has got more grain than he knows what to do with. He can't even store the stuff. And in verse 18, he says, I will do this, I'll tear down my barns, I will build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and goods, and I'll say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. And instead of worshipping God out of his wealth, he kicked back and he thought he'd made it. He wanted to put his feet up. And this guy had missed the entire point. And the next verses talk about what happens to this guy. He ends up dying. It says, Tonight your soul will be required of you. No eating. No drinking, no relaxing, no happiness. And this example is one that I really relate to. Because if we're honest, we live, most of us, in a fairly sheltered life. In a fairly, what we would call, blessed life. By world standards, we heard last week about poverty, we are rich. God has blessed me with pretty much everything most people have want. I've got a job, I can pay my bills, I've got a beautiful family, I can buy a car, I can feed my family. I can give them education. All of these things that we have, we take for granted. But too often, it turns out that my blessing, the one thing that God gives me, actually turns into the thing that gets in between me and God. Because I want more. It's never enough. It's like this insatiable desire that just sucks me into a vortex, and I feel like I can't escape. I want to work harder. I want that promotion, because then we can do this, and then we can do this. And my mindset does the same thing that happened to David. The same thing that happened to this farmer. And the first key point I want to make tonight is that there's a problem. And the problem is that sin distorts our view of happiness. Sin distorts our view of happiness. Because I understand what will actually give me happiness. I know in my head, but my greed, my lust, my eyes, they distort it. And you can probably relate to this in one way or another. And I end up worshipping the blessing instead of the one that blesses. And once you buy into this view, once you've gone there, it's almost like you can't escape. You get sucked in and it keeps on happening. And one of the things I'm really concerned about, and I wanted to bring to everyone's attention tonight, is that this view of happiness is not a worldly view, necessarily. It's not a non-Christian view in the sense of it only affects people out there. This view has actually crept into church. It's crept into mainstream evangelical mindsets, and it affects people like me, it affects people like you, and how we understand this is going to change the way that we relate to our Creator. There's this concept of Christians should be healthy Christians. They should be wealthy Christians. They should be prosperous. prosperous. They need to have their rights looked after. I need to get everything that I want. And it's made it into the church. And it's 
at, at its extremes, to me it stands out obvious and I just get this horrible reaction to it. But the problem is there's like a continuum of this. At its extremes, it's obvious. At its extremes, we're crowdfunding $70 million private jets to pay for people to fly around the world, to go to third world countries, to raise money, to rob rich, to people who have no money, and to take it back to a rich country. That's at its extreme. And that made world news, because they said, look at these Christians and look what they're doing. How embarrassing. But at the other continuum, we have this concept that, well, God, God wants me to be happy. We wouldn't go there. We wouldn't go there, but God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? And that's the reality. And I want to ask you to use discernment tonight. Use discernment in the things that you like on Facebook. Use discernment in the sermons that you listen to. Use discernment in the books that you read. Listen to slogans that are catchy. And run it past the filter that we have in the Word of God and say, does this glorify God or is this more of Martin Selgman's positive psychology? And you hear slogans that just, they're out of control. I've rephrased them all so they don't directly relate to a person or an individual so you can't pin them on them. But basically you hear things like, believe, receive, achieve. Speak that truth into life. Give more and you'll receive more. Things like that. And that's mainstream. That's not even too extreme. There's concepts out there which they're just, they're just peddling this bike that is so opposite to what we read in the gospel. It's so offensive. And we lap it up. We love it, if we're honest. And one opponent, a person who said, no, this is not right, again, I won't say his name, a direct quote from him, was, as a Christian... This is the concept, the belief behind this stuff. That as a Christian, you have the personal power, the personal power to create the life, to create life in the way you want it, in the name of Jesus. So we have the power to create life in the way we want it by calling on the name of Jesus. And behind these promises is flat out false Christianity. It's a false gospel. It's idolatry because they use the name of God, they use the name of Christ, and they create their own idol. And the scary thing is, I buy into it a little bit. Even though I've got a fairly reasonable grasp on what the Bible says. It's this contagious thing. And we can't escape it. They turn God into some kind of vending machine. And you put something into this thing, like it might be money or time, and out comes everything we want. Ching, ching. No, it's not like that. We dream about getting the things that we think will give us the perfect life now. And we all buy into it in some way or another. We do. And the people selling it, the people selling this stuff, because let's be honest, they're selling it. They've taken the things, if you think about it this way, that Satan actually uses to tempt us, and they trick people into making them feel like it's religious. They take temptation, covetousness, for example, and they convince us it's actually righteousness. And when Satan tempted Jesus, he did pretty much the same thing in the desert. He'd been out for 30 days fasting. He was hungry. He had a legitimate need for food. I could not, two days, I'd be done. 30, that's extreme, right? It says, actually, small, and he was hungry. Of course he was hungry, 30 days. He'd be starving. Anyway, he comes up to Jesus and he says, you know what? You need to eat. Just make some bread. You need to be healthy. Sounds legit. You need to be popular. People should like you. You're God. You want people to worship you? Just jump off the temple and see what happens. Look out there. Look at all that land. It can be yours. And the reality is that's the sort of thing that has woven itself into mainstream Christianity. And a magazine called Christianity Today, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, they did a, a survey to see how widespread it is. Because surely it's only like the tip of the iceberg. Maybe it's not that big. But they did this survey. Admittedly, it was in America, but still, we're pretty much the same. And they found that 17% of Christians actively identified themselves as belonging to one of these movements. So 17%, we've got one in six. It's a fairly high number. But 61% agreed with the concept that God wants us to be prosperous by worldly standards. 61%, over half. 31% agreed that if you give your money to God, God then replaces that with even more money than you started with. And these are the pretty much direct questions they asked them. Yep, 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 I agree with that. That all makes sense. And that's because it's infiltrated us so much. We've only got 17% who identify as belonging to this, but we've got 61% conceptually agree with it. 
And this theology is dangerous because it undermines the way we think. I've got a quote here from Rick Warren, who says, This idea that God wants everyone to be wealthy, baloney. It's creating a false idol. You don't measure your self-worth by your net worth. I can show you millions of faithful followers of Christ who live in poverty. And why isn't everyone in the church a millionaire? And the more you think about it, where is this, where's the hope in this false gospel? Where does it offer people whose dreams, or even their needs, their basic earthly needs are out of their reach? What hope does that offer them? You can't yell out to a, a person and say, hey, Ethiopian, maybe you wouldn't be living in a slum and starving if you just declared words of victory. What is that? That's disgraceful. And it comes up on my newsfeed all the time, and I think, get away from that. That's not God. That's not the one we worship. We don't have the power to create our own reality. It's rubbish. And people are being destroyed by it. And God's not being glorified by it. And there's so many people just getting rich off it. I remember having a conversation with, with Pastor Brian, who's, who's back in New Zealand now, but he told me something that is just it's stuck with me, and I'm, I'm still not quite sure, but in the concept of where I'm going, it makes sense. And he said that God cares more about our holiness than our happiness. What does that mean? What does that mean? And it's true in a way, because in a sense, if we're stuck in our own sin, and if we're worshipping our old, own idols, does God want me to be happy? Did God want David to be happy committing adultery with another woman? No, he didn't. And the consequences from his, that sin ended up turning him back to God. And if you read Psalm 51 at some point, you just see this amazing grace as he's restored. But the circumstances and the consequences of his sin meant that he couldn't be happy. But sometimes other people's sin affects us. Other things going on. And the reality is that we can't always be happy in circumstances. But the good news is there's so much more to life than just being what we call happy. There's so much more. We've seen the problem that sin, sin distorts our view of happiness, but the solution is that God gives us more than happiness. And that God tells us in his word how we can have joy throughout it. Read, read the Psalms. It's full of it. And you can see that God not only wants us to worship him, as we heard this morning, but God wants us to enjoy him forever. He wants us to find joy in him. And we've been hardwired to find joy in God alone. So nothing else will make it for us. Everything else is vanity, as it says in Ecclesiastes. Try your hardest, but vanity, vanity. It'll get you nowhere. And we've got a quote here from C.S. Lewis that just gives such a good picture, such a good picture of why it doesn't work. It's fairly lengthy, but I'll read it here. It says, What Satan puts into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could be like gods, could set up on their own as if they'd created themselves, be their own masters, invent some sort of happiness for themselves outside of God, apart from God, and out of that hopeless attempt comes everything we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, that long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God that will make him happy. The reason why it can never succeed is this, is that God made us. He invented us as a man invents the engine, and a car is made to run on petrol, and it would not run properly on anything else. Now, God designed the human machine to run on himself. He himself is the fuel our spirits were designed to burn on. He is the food our spirits were designed to feed on. There is no other. And that's why it's no good. It's no good asking for God to make you happy outside, in our own way, without bothering about religion. God can't give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it's just not there. There is no such thing. Isn't that true? And I, I remind myself of that. But I get sucked into this thing and then constantly I remind myself, hang on, where am I? Not where God wants me to be. Wow. No wonder. No wonder life looks hard when it's actually not in the scheme of humanity. The reality is that worshipping God brings true joy. It brings blessing. And it does actually bring happiness. But not the happiness we talked about at the start. 
God provides more than happiness. And we can see in Scripture that we can be blessed by God. We can have joy, contentment, peace, fulfillment, and even happiness. When we look in the Scripture, we see that God wants us to enjoy Him. And there's so many passages that talk about this. I wanted to call a few out tonight. Psalm 1611 is the first one. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. This is the definition of happiness we just first started talking about. Fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. That's what everyone's going for and they can't get it. Read this. It's here. Psalm 1910, talking about God's law, which people typically not a fan of, even Christians, ooh, law, ooh, prefer the grace part. But anyway, speaking of law, speaking about the rules, it says, More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings from the honeycomb. What beautiful imagery. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. These two verses, the second and third, they just go together so well. Because the reality is you can't explain taste. You need to experience it. Honey. What does it taste like? I don't know. I've never had honey. Well, it tastes like sugar. Hmm. I've never had sugar. So you haven't got this concept of sweet? No, I don't understand sweet. I've had stale bread. Is stale bread like honey? No, it's not. But you can't even join these two things together. They're so opposite that unless you've actually tasted it, you can't possibly understand it. They don't go together. And it's exactly like that with the joy in God. If you haven't experienced it yourself, you can hear about it, but you can't connect the experience with the words you're hearing because they don't make sense. You can't possibly know. And the crazy thing I want to bring your attention to is those three verses. Those three verses are written by King David, the same guy who was confused, who let his idolatry get in the way of his God, and he made a mistake. Talk about regret. But we do this to ourselves. I do this. I forget and I lose my way. I need to constantly remind myself of this principle. I just stop the media, the messages I get, from blinding myself to what I know. God does ask for self-sacrifice. and He does ask for obedience. But God's not a killjoy. God wants the best for us. When we experience God's glory, when we experience true joy, everything else looks like rubbish. Why go there? But we do. The joy that God talks about is so deep, so intense, it can't be compared to the happiness we're talking about. It's, it's not the same thing. Can you compare that to buying a new car or having a job or being rich? No, it's no comparison. I don't know what you're going through because the reality is some people in this room might be suffering horribly. You might not be healthy. You might not be wealthy. You might just be hanging on. But in the Bible, we can see hope beyond our circumstances. What we described as happiness is affected by these circumstances. Did I have a good day? Can I put food on the table? Am I sick in bed? Are my relationships breaking down? Are people around me dying? All of these things affect what we would call happiness. Happiness, in one sense, is temporary. But God offers permanent joy, even in the midst of terrible circumstances. In Philippians 4, 12 and 13, we read about this concept. It bridges the gap between how do I be happy when things aren't going well. And we read, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. And I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What a beautiful promise. We take that last bit, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, so out of context. It's talking about suffering. It's talking about going without. It's not talking about... I can nab this awesome job, or I can, you know, <laughs> the context is, is everything. In Acts 16, we see another example. Midnight, they're in jail. First century jail, bad place to be. No one wants to be there. And what do we see? You're walking past, you hear a noise. What's that noise? We must have some crazy people in there because they're singing praises. They're praying, they're singing, and they're worshipping God. It doesn't even make sense. It just goes completely beyond what we would normally say would make us happy. In jail, who knows? Are we going to die? doesn't matter. God knows. Praise God. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't quite compute. It goes beyond our circumstances and our understanding. And in a first world country where pretty much we've got most of the things we want, it can be a bit hard to grasp this concept. 
But in a third world country, or in a situation where things aren't going our way, and there's nothing in our control to change that, that's the answer. Right there, the fact that God is steadfast, the fact that God offers joy, God offers hope beyond our circumstances, that is the answer. And solves so much hurt. So much of the pain, so much of the loss that people experience every day. When our prayers don't get answered, we can say, okay, God's got a plan. God can give me joy, even though I don't have this bigger house or whatever it is. The Bible reading that we had tonight, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 and 17, that's why I looked out of context with happiness, because there's nothing happy there. But it is. It is. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. It's beyond it. And if we keep the end game in mind, if we compare the eternal glory beyond all comparison to our circumstances, Paul says, well, what is it? It's light and it's momentary. Nothing in Paul's resume was light or momentary. It sounded like a fairly horrific lifestyle to me. <laughs> you got to read it. It's amazing that he can say light and momentary, but the reality is, how long is your life? It might be 80 years. It might be more. It might be a lot less. We don't know. But he's looking to eternity, and he can say 80 years is nothing compared to infinite glory. But how do we get there? The third point I want to make tonight is that we can't get there. We can't get there. But there's a person who can get us there. Jesus is the one that delivers on God's promise. Jesus is the way. Joy is not found in our circumstances. It's found in a relationship. In John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It says that he's the way back to the Father, the designer, the creator, the source of joy. He's the one who blesses us. And that changes everything. Because true lasting joy is found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. We couldn't make it on our own. And our sin has stood, it still stands between us and fellowship with God. Our attempts at reaching God were never enough. But God reached down and he provided Jesus to take the punishment that we deserved. And through faith in him we can be forgiven. But the good thing is that's not just where it stops. Reunited restored and adopted by the one who created us to worship, to find joy in him. In John 10.10, 10, I love this verse. I came that you may have life, doesn't stop there, and life abundantly is where it goes. We have an abundant life. We can be forgiven from sin, yes. But Jesus isn't just a ticket to heaven. He's our pathway in life. He gives us this abundant life, life to the full that we can't dream of. It's more than happy. Now that we have a relationship with him, now we can taste. Now we can see that the Lord is good. Is the Lord good for you? I know he is, but you might not have tasted and seen. And we see this concept again in the Apostle Paul's life, in Philippians 3, 7 and 8. And he says, But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Why? In order that I may gain Christ. Everything else is rubbish. Christ is everything. Knowing Christ and experiencing joy in him makes everything else seem less than average. And what does it mean for us? What does it mean for me? The question is, what is it that we are worshipping? Are we worshipping God in spirit and truth? Are we really? Or have idols got in the way? There's a few different responses we can make. The first one is you can completely disagree to everything I've said. That's option one. You can go with Mark Silgman, try his path for happiness, work your hardest to get there. You may get there. But the sad reality is the amount of people who end up depressed and suicide who are wealthy, famous rock stars, I could probably name 10, who have everything in life except for happiness. 
Madonna was one who said in an interview, so are you happy? And she said, I don't know anyone who's happy. She'd probably know some rich, important people. They're not happy. The other thing you can do is you can keep on looking at God like a vending machine. You can keep on focusing on what it is you think will make you happy. You can keep turning God into an idol who provides your every wish. But he may not. And then where will your faith be? There's no hope in idolatry like that. There's no hope in a God like that. Or through Jesus, we can start to do what you're designed for, to worship God and experience fullness of joy. If we're doing what we're designed for, the engine runs well. We've got the right fuel, and the engine runs well. You might already be there. But this might be something that you have to remind yourself of. It's something that I constantly have to remind myself of. Like I said, the media. I take, every now and then, a break from Facebook or something because I just find it's addictive and it just brings me into a place where I don't want to be. Think about what it is that draws your attention away from Christ, from the joy, and focus on the stuff that will start to actually make you happy. It's not what you think. In Matthew 13, 44, we read a story that puts it into context. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and he covered up. And then in his joy, he goes and he sells all that he has, and he buys the field. He stumbles upon this thing by pure fluke. Wow, it's worth everything. I'm selling everything. I'm buying that field because I want that treasure. The next story, there's a merchant, and he's searching eagerly for this pearl. He wants that pearl. He's looking, and he finds the pearl. And he sells everything he's got to try and buy that pearl, and he buys it. In God's grace, he might just, you might just stumble across him. What's your response? Is he your treasure? Do you treasure him? Is he worth more? Or are you a person like someone like Martin Silverman who's putting a lot of energy into finding happiness? You're searching for this thing. Maybe in God's grace, he'll reach down and he'll make it completely obvious to you. Still, it has to be your treasure. Do you treasure this? What you value most, what your time and effort and money go into, what you're working hardest for, what your, where your pleasure comes from, that's actually what you treasure. So think about what it is. Think about what it is you treasure based on your time, based on what you pin on Pinterest or your albums, what your Google search history is about. That'll demonstrate what you're worshipping. It's where your time is. The first thing is the problem is that sin has distorted our view of happiness. But the solution is that God gives us so much more than happiness. And the person is that Jesus delivers on God's promise. We were designed for so much more than a distorted view of happiness. We were designed to worship God, and doing that provides what we need for a life of joy, for blessing, for contentment, and for a relationship with Christ. We find our way back to God, who designed us for joy in him. Final quote from C.S. Lewis. Last page of mere Christianity. Get, get that book. Get it and read it. Good stuff is not always new. It's been around for a while. It's so encouraging. It says, submit yourself and you will find your real self. Lose yourself and you will save it. Submit to death, death of your ambitions and your favorite wishes every day and death of your whole body. And in the end, submit every fiber of your being and you will find eternal life. Keep back Nothing. Nothing you have not given away will be really yours. Nothing in you that has not died will ever be raised from the dead. Look for yourself and you'll find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin and decay. But look for Christ and you'll find him. And with him, everything else thrown in. I just want to encourage you tonight with a few words from a song. It says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Just look. Look in his face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. It's so true. Compared to Jesus, everything else is rubbish. And it's not meant to trivialize your pain. It's the answer to your pain. Joy is there. Blessing is there. 